please stand and worship.
songs be a sign that we are here for you. And we are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. And we are here for you. And we are here for you. are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem. Your renown fill the sky, and we are here for you. And we are here for you. Let your word move in power, and let what's dead come to life, and we are here for you. And we are here for you. You our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Thank you. 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. We started uh, last week going through the book of Colossians, and um, part of the reason for me going through the book of Colossians is I felt that, um, you know, we have this push for discipleship. We're supposed to be growing in our faith. We're supposed to be walking as Christians. We're supposed to be doing the work of Jesus and the mission that he's called us to do, and that is to make disciples, and in making disciples, we got to be disciples. And if we're going to be disciples, we need to know what that means to be disciples. And we need to, we need to know what it is that we believe if we are going to teach people uh, all that Jesus commanded his disciples. And so going through the book of Colossians, is, um, I felt was a, would be a good way to do that. It echoes a lot of the same sorts of uh, ideas that you get in the book of Ephesians. But it also comes at it with some um, uh, very strong what we call Christology, being to tell us, to present us who Jesus is, revealing to us who Jesus is, um, so that we know Christ for ourselves, okay? Um, and so Paul has written this letter, and uh, we think it's probably written around early 80s, 60s, and um, he was addressing... Uh, this group of Christians there to um, encourage them, to challenge them. And there's no real definitive understanding of what particular problems were going on in the church there, other than the fact that there were some ideas that were being taught there and that maybe the congregation was being captivated or captured by that Paul wanted to address. Um, 
And without knowing all of what they call the Colossian heresy, we don't know exactly what it all was. There are indications as we read through this letter as to what was going on or what sorts of things might have been drawing the people away from uh, what we call orthodox faith. And so in chapter 2, in verses 8 and verse 16 and verse 20, there's a few different things that, that... Paul is warning them about, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental uh, spirits of the world and not according to Christ. A little bit later on, it says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. Uh, Verse 20 says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? And so I share that with you because this is always the challenge of the early church. This is, like like I said before, and continue to go on, there's just so much bad teaching from the beginning of the church that goes on, misunderstandings about things. They didn't have uh, the New Testament writings that we have now. And so the Apostle Paul is addressing much of what he written, what he wrote in the New Testament for those sorts of things, you know, to address uh, the bad teaching, to make sure that people don't get swallowed up into some sort of ideas that aren't consistent with what it means to be a Christian. And we are in danger of that as well. We have, we talked about podcasts, we talked about stuff that streams online, you can watch stuff on YouTube, you can get all sorts of things. It turns out that people are doing things with the sound on videos now, too, and making people say things they didn't actually say. Wow, you better watch out, huh? And so those are the sorts of things that are coming out there, and and it's been ongoing, but it continues uh, to go on. And so uh, I guess as a shepherd, my feeling is that I want to make sure that I can do all I can to protect you from that. And the best way to do that is to give you the truth. And so that's my um, desire, and uh, I pray that it would be something that um, strengthens each one of us to continue to live out our faith in Christ. The idea in uh, going through this book of Colossians, or at least in this passage today, is to, to give Christ first place in every area of our life, okay? To give Christ first place in every area of our life. I think um, I, wanna, I want you to know I was encouraged here it wasn't just this past week, but it's recently I was reading through a, a pastor who had preached for a number of years, and, and uh, his, his idea was that he would try to make the sermons so simple that each person in the congregation would say, I could have, did, I could have done that. I could have preached that. And that was all right. And I want you to know that if you feel like that's how it is with me too, I'm glad for you on that. That means you understand it. That means you're getting it. And so the idea is to try to make it simple, to put the cookies on the low shelf, if you will, so that we can all share those things together. And so uh, that's that's what I'm trying to do. So I just want to let you know and let you hear my heart a little bit in all of this, okay? We want to give Christ first place in every area of our life. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 15. We ended verse 14 uh, last week. And if you remember, uh, as you're turning there to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, we talked about last week the idea of strengthening your faith because as Paul is writing this letter, he's talking to them and and letting them know that, you know, these are... uh, uh, that Christ has done this, he's saved you, and, and he's redeemed you, and he wants us to grow. And so um, that's what I'm going to keep on encouraging us to do um, as we go through this book. So as we pick up in verse 15 here, let me read it, and uh, you can follow along. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat in front of you, or the scriptures will be projected on the screens around me. It says this, referring to the beloved Son, Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and in invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, the first point here, just getting into that, is that Jesus is ruler over all creation. Jesus is ruler over all creation. Um, in talking about Jesus, verse 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And Christ as the image of God uh, means, it means that when we see Christ, everything that we see in Christ corresponds to what God is about. So that Jesus could say and did say, if you've seen the Father, you've, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So the idea here is that as him being the image of the invisible God is that he is not only a mirror who reflects who God is, but he is also a manifestation, a 3D incarnation, if you will, because that's who Jesus is, right? The incarnation is that he is... Uh, when seeing him, you see God. He's a manifestation of God. The word for image is the word we get icon from. You know, icon like in your computer, right? And so you look on your computer and you have a little icon there. And if I press on that icon on my computer and double click it, it comes up with all sorts of things. And it says, here are documents and here are programs and here are different things that are on this computer. And that little icon, once I click it on, everything that's in this computer shows up. Okay, And so this is the idea here of Jesus being the image of the invisible God. We get to see what you normally couldn't see because God is invisible. You get to see God and his son, the image, the incarnation, the son of God, Jesus Christ. So we have Christ as the image of God. And that means that when we see Christ, what we see in Christ corresponds uh, to God. I got a few slides up here. And I want to bring you through here just to help you to see that this is not something that just appears in the book of Colossians. The reason I gave you the date of, the, of this book is so that you can think about what's been developed, what's happening in the first century, what's happening in the early church. And uh, 2 Corinthians is written uh, uh, earlier than Colossians, probably uh, 10, 10 years earlier. And so in 2 Corinthians, you have the Apostle Paul talking about uh, the image of God as well. It says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. There it is. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Christ is emanating, if you will, the glory of God. Christ is the, uh, is the one who shows us what God's glory is about. And so he's the image of God. And that means when we see Christ, what we see in Christ corresponds to what God is or who God is. It says also here, um, going back to that, uh, moving on to the next uh, slide here, is that the idea as we go through this, it says he is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. And the New International Version says the firstborn over all creation. Am I right in your Bibles? Do you have NIV? Any of you have an NIV? No. Okay. If you have the Pew Bible, it'll say that there. Okay. And that is just trying to make it clear as to what's actually being said here. When it talks about firstborn of all creation, it's not talking about uh, some people believed, and this was what they call a Sibelianism that took place because there was a teacher named Sibeli who said that uh, in the early church that there's this idea that Jesus is the first created being of the things that God created. And did you hear the difference there? He is the first created. Jesus is the first creation. And that's not what the church is held to. Right? The church hasn't held to that. Jesus has been eternal. Jesus is pre-existent. And Jesus is through Jesus. Everything that is created has been created. So before anything ever was created, there was Jesus. That's the whole idea of in the beginning. John says this as well in John chapter 1, verse 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, right? I always get that kind of mixed up at the end there. But the idea is that in the beginning, Jesus is there. And so you had this teaching that was going on early in the, the church by this guy. And so the church has to decide, and when I say decide, they have to go to the scriptures, prayerfully consider, and determine what is it that God has given us here? What is it that God has revealed to us in his word? How are we to understand these truths? Because sometimes you just say, hey, it's, it doesn't matter. You know, Jesus is cool. Right on, man. I believe in Jesus. That's it. But who is Jesus? And why do you believe in him? And what is the foundation for what it is that you hold true, for the faith that you have, for the living hope we talked about last week? And it rests in Jesus. He is the firstborn of all creation. And this word here, talking about firstborn, the Greek word is prototikos. And it has to do with having the the inheritance rights, the, the, all the privileges of the firstborn. And it basically is talking about having the superiority or the authority and the power to do what one wants with whatever is being talked about, having firstborn rights over that. And so in this case here, it's saying that Jesus, he is the firstborn of all creation. And so uh, looking at this, kind of giving you some more verses here. It says that uh, in the book of Hebrews at the beginning, it says in, in times past that God spoke to us in various ways to the fathers and to the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, right? So this is this idea of Jesus Christ having the authority, having the power as well, through whom also he created the world. So the reason I say this is because I ran into... Um, uh, somebody, and when I was out in Minnesota a couple of weeks ago, and they come from the Jehovah's Witnesses, and so we began to talk a little bit about this, and I really wasn't in the mood to talk about it, and I really didn't have time. I was eating breakfast with my daughter, and, and so um, we talked a little bit about it, but they take these verses, and they understand them differently. They look and see Jesus as a created being. And, you know, part of uh, understanding the theology in all of this, too, is just understanding that when a perfect, righteous, holy God has, has, has been um, insulted, sinned against, the only way to satisfy the wrath or the anger, if you will, of a perfect, righteous, holy God is to offer a perfect, righteous, holy sacrifice. And the only one who could offer a perfect, righteous, holy sacrifice to God would be God himself. Right? The, the, the testimony of the scriptures is by ourselves. We don't have anything to offer to God by ourselves. Nothing that could satisfy him for the offense that we have committed against him. I'm trying to speak to you in more forensic terms there so that you can understand rationally what I'm, what I'm saying here. And so the idea here is that if this is the case, 
If God is perfect and he needs a perfect holy sacrifice, then only, a, only God can offer the sacrifice for, for, for our sins and make it right with him. This is the idea of Jesus being the mediator. He's the one who reaches from heaven and reaches down and connects heaven and earth in his person because he is fully man and he is fully God. And so when we talk about him being made in the, uh, that he is the image, he is the exact representation uh, of, of God and that he uh, uh, sustains things by the word of his power, we're talking about Jesus being God in all of this. Continuing on here, um, Hebrews 1, verses 3 through 4, just continuing in that passage. He, talking about Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. I point this passage out to you because the writer in Hebrews is making this point throughout the book, is that in Jesus, we have somebody who is higher and superior to the angels. In Jesus, we have somebody who is higher and superior than the Aaronic priesthood, you know, Aaron, the priest of the Jews, the Israelites, somebody who is a priest who is better than Aaron, Because Jesus is one who knows the temptations, but yet is without sin. And so the writer is making this point, and I point it out to you because Jesus is not a created being. Jesus has always existed. Before anything was, he is. That's why all those I am statements are kind of cool, right? Before Abraham was, I am. And that's where it brings in all sorts of questions about who are you then? So Hebrews uh, says this, and the thing about a little bit later on in, in the book of Hebrews, it says, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. I'm letting you know this here because God does not share his glory with anybody else, right? Amen? I, I have that, uh, this next verse, and I left it off. It's actually the very end of this verse. You can look it up for yourself, Isaiah 48, 11. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. This is God talking about why he's taking care of the Israelites, even though he doesn't have to, right? And it's uh, for how should my name be profaned? And then at the end, he says, my glory, I will not give to another. So he doesn't share his glory with anybody else but himself. But think about this now, okay? So he's telling here in Hebrews chapter 1, who else did God ever say, hey, the angels come and worship you? It's him. It's God. Jesus is God. And so I'm, I'm saying that to you because I want you to understand. Theologically speaking, this is what we're talking about. And if God doesn't want any other idols or anything in front of him, he can't have some created being because the whole argument in Romans chapter 1 is that people reject, they suppress the truth and they reject God and they worship instead creatures. And God is saying, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. And so our worship to Christ is right because Jesus is God incarnate. He is the image of the invisible God, going back to, to, uh, to the text here. Um, I'm going to flip back into these. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, talking about Jesus and, and what, he's, what he's done, and we think about creation Everything was made by or in him. Everything was made through him. Everything was made for him. And so we see this, you know, in the beginning, right? Hebrews chapter, I mean, uh, Genesis chapter 1, 1. In the beginning, God created. And then John 1 says, Jesus is the one who created. So how are we to understand this idea? 
And so the theologians would say it was the will of the Father uh, carried out in the agency of the Son uh, brought about by the power of the Spirit, of the workings of the Spirit. So one, one way of looking at it, and I thought maybe this might be kind of a way to understand it, any, just understand that any illustration or analogy made to try to help us to understand uh, the Trinity is always going to come up short. So if you talk about a pretzel, you know, and you have the three holes in there, and then it's all one pretzel, and if you break off part of it, it ceases to be the whole pretzel. That's not the, the idea of the Trinity. Each person in the Trinity contains the exact essence of God and can do uh, whatever God does. Okay, that's where we talk about the very nature of God, the essence of who God is. And so when we talk about these analogies, some people have said, uh, you know, you can look at an egg and you have a shell and then you have the white part. What's the white part of an egg called? <coughs> Who said that? You... White. white. Don't you call it the albumin? Albumin? Oh. Yeah, right? yeah, right? And then the yellow part is called the yolk, right? You know, and there are some ways that people could tell you, spell the word joke, spell the word joke, spell the word joke, and then they say, what's the yellow part of an, or white part of an egg, and then people say yolk. You know, have you ever, you never done that one before? Okay, all right. Spell stop, spell stop, spell stop. What do you do when you come to a green light? Yeah, you, you, you know it, because you're sharp. I know, but if you didn't know I was messing with you, and I came up and just was so innocent about it, I could probably get you, Priscilla. I think so. <laughs> anyway, I'm not about to try that right now. Anyway, so the idea here about, uh, you know, looking at the Trinity, it can be like God is a visionary, if you will. Just start to look at God being a visionary, Jesus being the architect, and the Holy Spirit being the general contractor, you know? Kind of a way of looking at it, too. So it's kind of like, you know, when we look out at the parking lot out there, you know, we say, I'll stand in the pulpit as a pastor of the church and say, we put in the parking lot. I didn't do anything when it comes to the work that was done in putting in the parking lot, right? We had an idea. We contracted some people to do it there. We talked to them. We paid them. But I did not do the work, right? But I can still say we did that in the same way that we put on the roof, right? So it, it, that's the idea of, of seeing things here. You don't have to do it every last minute of it to get the credit for doing it. Does that make sense? Okay. So try to give you that for uh, just to try to understand how the, the, the Godhead works, the triune God, what we call the Trinity. And there's no conflict in the persons in the Trinity. There is only harmony. There is nothing that uh, the Father wants done that the Son is not going to do, even though there's some struggle sometime like we saw in the Garden of Eden. Our garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane, excuse me. It's all these gardens, right? That's a, that's, that's a different one, okay? But there's harmony there, and there is uh, the workings of the, the Godhead, and there's no conflict there. And there is what we call subordination, not of persons, but of functions, so that the Father sends the Son, the Father does not go. The Son pays the penalty and for our sins on the cross. The Father does not do that. The Holy Spirit does not do that. The Holy Spirit comes and He strengthens us. He's given by the Father and the Son. So you see there are different functions, different roles. And I say this because you say, well, what is this all about? This is what we got going on in, in, in the churches and in our society. When you talk about relationships between man and, and a husband and wife, right? We're talking about the subordination of functions or different functions. We're not talking about somebody being more important than somebody else. But yet that seems to be the thing. If I can't do what you do, then somehow or another I'm second class. I can't give birth to babies. Someone asked me about that, and I said, I can't. It's not that I necessarily desire to do it, but it's something I won't be able to do. And I know we're talking about science and oh, who knows what they'll do in the future. But you can't right now, right? You can't. 
It's just, there's just something in the design that doesn't work there. And so just trying to understand the relationship between husband and wife, too. It's not because somebody does this that they're more important than somebody else. In the same way that you got the Godhead operating the way the Godhead is operating. And this, these truths that we think, oh, man, it doesn't really matter, it comes to affect our very daily lives. This is what's going on in our society. And so we want to hold to these truths and we want to see, hey, there's, there's practicality in it. It's just not that there's just some deep theological stuff because I went to seminary and spent X number of dollars and time and energy doing that, that somehow or another I need to justify that by telling you these things. They're important. That's why they're there. And we need to, 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 to hold to the truth there. So it says here that all things were created in heaven and on earth. And it's talking about all of the visible creation, the next part of that verse here. Visible and and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And we think this is something in the, in, uh, the spiritual realm we're talking about here. They were created through him and for him. So when you think about what has been created, it's all been created. Anything that's been created was created through Jesus. And so when we think about that, even Satan, yes, even Satan. Isn't that wild? And this is why it's important to, for you to understand that. Because as we're reading through this, this is the argument that Paul is going to make in here. Hey, you don't have to worry about this, that, or the other thing. Because anything that you want to look to, you know, angels or, or powers or any sorts of authorities... They all fall underneath Jesus. And as a Christian, you are adopted into God's family. You are the body of Christ. You don't need to worry about that stuff. You don't need to go with the second class, you know, leaders, if you will. You go straight to the top. And so he's making this point here about everything that was created. He says, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So you talk about before all things. We're talking about the idea that he's, he's ahead of all things. But before, when you talk about in time or in eternity past, Jesus is there. And so he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's not just that he maintains them, even though that word is sometimes used, or he sustains a creation. It's the idea that he holds things together, but they also remain in their proper order, if you will. Granted, we live in a fallen world. Granted, there is still some ultimate uh, um, um, reconciliation, or I guess restitution, or or. I guess that's the word I'm going to use, reconstruction, something like that, anyway, that will come together there that's not done yet, but the idea is that things are are being actively uh, maintained, sustained, and and held in a place where they're in their proper order. In, In a way, you know, I watched this movie one time, and I just watched little parts of it, and there was this this woman there, and there was this drug that they had given to her, and it caused her cells to replicate really fast, and she, made, she became really smart and stuff like that, so that, because, you know, the theory is that we can only use 10% of our brains, so if you could somehow or another harness the power and find a way to use more and more of your brain, that you would be able to do all sorts of things that you can't do now. And so this, this, this movie here, and I know you guys don't watch so many movies, but that's life to me, Ray, okay? That's watching movies, you know? That's my connection to the culture. So, so we have a good time. Thanks, Ray. Um, and so this, this drug's there, and, 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 and what's happening there is that her, her body is, you know, brain is doing all this stuff there, and it talks about self um, preservation or something like that, that that's the idea. And, you know, it's based on some strange things. But the idea is that what was happening to her is her, her body was starting to fall apart, you know? And it was kind of wild. And it's like, this is nuts. Okay. But that's the idea, right? That Jesus is holding things together. He's maintaining things. And so when you go outside and you walk around, could you imagine what if a, what if a little squirrel all of a sudden became a giant bear right in front of you, you know? 
and became, instead of this little thing, all of a sudden it became big. Well, you say, well, you know, the thing, that can't happen because how could he grow so fast? I'm saying if things weren't working the way they're supposed to, these things could happen, okay? It would be crazy, right? You know? You go into you go into pet a little dog or something. It turns out it's a lion or something like that. You know, I'm just I know it's it's far fetched, but I want you to kind of imagine this is this is what Jesus is holding together here, and so he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay, we're going to get to point number two now. Here we go. Jesus is the ruler over the church. All right. So this first idea, or these first verses here, are talking about the idea that Jesus rules over creation. And when we think about the church, we think about a new creation, right? Each of us is a new creature in Christ. So there's this new creation going on, and he is the ruler of all of that, too. So verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn. There's this idea again from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent or he might have first place. That's why I said give Christ first place in every area of your life because he's ruler of creation. He's ruler of the church. He should be ruler of everything in our lives as well. And so as we're reading this, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So there's that firstborn term there again, and he's talking about over. In the case of Jesus, of course, he's the first one to ever resurrect, unless you count Lazarus, right? But Jesus raised him up. He was dead. He said it, but Lazarus ended up dying again, correct? Correct? Yes. Even the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Lazarus because if they could do that, then they could say, see, Jesus didn't raise him from the dead. His power is not sustaining. But he did raise him from the dead to show as a pre-shadowing or a foreshadowing of what he was going to do in terms of a permanent resurrection. And so he's the firstborn from the dead, that in everything in him might be preeminent, first place. So he's over creation. He's ruler over the church. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And I say that here, if you look at verse 19, I'm going to go back to the slide. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This comes down to this teaching of this guy, Sibeli, before as well. And here's the idea that the fullness of God is in Jesus Christ. The fullness of deity dwells in Christ. For in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So it was God's pleasure in all of this. This is not something that, that it was, there was some sort of uh, disagreement in the Godhead. This is how it works. It's God's pleasure here uh, that, to, that the fullness of God would dwell in Christ and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we're seeing that Jesus here is the fullness of God, and it's through him he's seeking to reconcile all of creation to himself, so that the focus, the goal of all creation, is to turn back towards Jesus for his glory. Wild, isn't it? You know, the young people, they do this to me. when I, We talk about really big ideas, and they go, Right? Like it just blew a, blew a fuse in their minds and stuff like that. And I hope this does this to you because it does it to me too. You know? And so here it is. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or heaven or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so when you think about this all things, there is something there, once again, about about all creation, and we, we read this in the book of Romans as well, and it talks about, you know, all creation is waiting to see who the sons of God will be because creation is, is, is subjected to futility. From an English guy there from England, they say the word futile, right? They say futile, Dalton. 
Futile, right? And then they say hostile too, right? We say hostile, futile. Futile, right? So the, the, it says there in, in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation is, is subject to futility, but it goes even a step more here when it talks about us being hostile in verse 21. I know that's not up there, but being hostile towards God, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. So there was this need for, for, for reconciliation, and so I got a couple of more verses up here. I just want to show you. And uh, talking uh, uh, in Romans 1, and was declared, talking about Jesus Christ, to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we see that he has that power. Romans chapter 8, I told you already. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Oh, this is a different part of that later in that chapter. To be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So you got both those ideas being in that verse about image and firstborn as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So this idea here about being the, the firstborn uh, from the dead comes out. Okay? So um, just kind of giving you all of that. And just to help you to see that these aren't my own ideas. These are things that come from the scripture. And so we got to understand that in Christ, the fullness of God dwells. That's why what Christ does matters. Okay, he's not just a good guy, kind of like you and me, and we can just get by so far by doing something good. He is God incarnate. He is able to bring about whatever he determines to do. Um, this talked about um, when we were going through Ephesians chapter 1. We talked about uh, there was a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. That would be Jesus, things in heaven, and things on earth. And so here it is, once again, re reconciling to himself all things. Philippians 2, verse 10 through 11, talks about so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it's consistent with what we read in other parts as well. It's the idea that everything in creation goes back to Jesus, kneels at his, uh, at his name, and gives glory. And when we talk about this, we say, hey, in this passage in Philippians 2, we said that's either voluntarily as people who have trusted in Christ, or it's involuntary darily, as people who have rejected Christ, but nevertheless kneel at his feet and say he is Lord. So this is all of creation, okay? Uh, last point here. He is the reconciler of sinners. That would be Jesus is the reconciler of sinners. So there was a need for reconciliation. It wasn't just that, oh, all of a sudden Jesus popped out and said, hey, let's go and make things right here when nothing's wrong. There's something that's wrong. It says, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Like I told you before, we're not just, there's not just futility in creation. There is hostility, hostility towards God in mind. How is that shown? Because we disobey God. It says doing evil deeds there. And it says, now he has reconciled uh, in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless. So there was a need for recon uh, reconciliation. We were alienated by our actions. Uh, we were hostile to, towards God. And then there's a price for reconciliation as well. And that price is that Jesus pours out his life. He pours out his body. Uh, it says the body of flesh by his death. And there's, a, a, there's a, 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 a reason that God does this. And it's, you know, when you think about God reconciling with us, you know, it's like the idea of a marriage couple. And one party has messed up in the relationship. And it's the other party who is seeking reconciliation, right? That's the picture here. We're the ones who are hostile towards God, and he's the one in his love is reaching out to us to bring us into right relationship with him. Hallelujah. That's wild, isn't it, Logan? Because we always think, why should I reconcile with them? They need to be, say sorry to me. They're the ones who offended me. Well, God could be like that too. 
But instead, he takes the initiative to bring us into right relationship with him. He is the one who shows true love and values the relationship with us more than we even value it. It's wild. God is working more for us than we work for ourselves. He wants it more than we want it for ourselves. And hallelujah, that's great because we don't want it enough. So he's got to want it for us. Sad, but overwhelming at the same time. Here we go. So there's a price for reconciliation. We're the ones that messed up. God is the one who, who seeks to remedy that. He's the one who reconciles. There's a purpose for reconciliation. It says, um, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So this echoes back to Ephesians chapter 2 when it talks about we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works with God prepared beforehand for us to do. And so here, it's the same idea here, that there is something that God wants to do. He wants to present us blameless and holy and above reproach uh, when it's all said and done. And so what he has done, he's reconciled. What What he will do is present us holy and blameless. And in between, here's where we're supposed to be Uh, carrying out our responsibility. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all uh, creation. All creation under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. So he's talking about his proclamation. But verse 23 is not so much about doubting whether these people are saved or not. It's the idea that in, 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 Already having been reconciled, this is what we're supposed to be doing, and this is what God promises He will do in presenting us blameless and holy. And so we want to we want to uh, keep those things in mind that we're not just saved for the purpose of, of of saying that we're saved. We're saved because we're living for God. We're carrying out His purposes. I want to share something with you real fast here to close talking about this idea of reconciliation. And uh, I met this man here the last couple of days. And um, we tried to help him out a little bit. Um, and I gave him a ride down to Pier yesterday. And in doing so, I got to share the gospel with him. And he prayed to receive Christ. And put him on a bus. He was going to Texas. He texted me at 3.30 in the morning, and he told me, the fight is on, but I have your words that he will save me. He's holding on to the truth. And I sent it back to him, and I said, I said here's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Texted him that in the middle of the night at 4.30 when I realized my phone went off at 3.30. So if you call me and I'm in a deep sleep, I might not get it right away. Try again. But um, texted him back and said, here's God's words. I said, I did tell you that, but his words are more faithful than anything I can tell you. And he will stay true to it. And that's God carrying out his purposes. That's God being faithful to who he is and to what he's done. Jesus is ruler of creation. Jesus is ruler of the church. Jesus is the reconciler. And because he's first in all of that, he needs to be first in every area of our lives. So if we call ourselves Christian, and I'm not doubting that any one of you who calls yourselves Christian, uh, call yourself a Christian, is a Christian. But what I'm saying is, let's put him first. Let's live that out. Let's continue to do that and be the salt and light in this community that God has called us to do. Amen?